Well, welcome to the second annual Inclusion Fusion Disability Ministry Web Summit presented by Key Ministry and PajamaConference.com. I'm Dr. Matthew Stanford, and I'll be talking to you today about viewing mental illness through the eyes of faith. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience at uh, Baylor University. I'm also the director and co-founder of Mental Health Grace Alliance, which is a faith-based nonprofit organization that offers support and assistance to those living with mental illness and their loved ones. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But today, let's talk about mental illness, uh, which is a significant problem and a significant problem that the church has a great role to play in recovery and healing from. So I'd like to start out with a definition of mental illness because I think a lot of times that's one of the problems. People have different definitions or different ideas of what mental illness is. Mental illness can be defined as having a, a blue mood or a, a sad state. They actually have something that's abnormally functioning in their brain. Mental illness is not a problem that we just have in the United States or in the West. It's a global problem. 450 million people suffer from mental illness or behavioral disorder in the world. If you were to put that in the context of uh, populations of countries, that would be the third largest country of individuals in the world. Again, if you put that in the context of the United States, 350 million people live in the United States, but 450 million people in the world have mental illness. Uh, that's one in four families in the world are dealing with a mentally ill loved one and trying to care for that individual. Nearly one million individuals will die every year from suicide, uh, which is a tragic uh, statistic. Four of the six leading causes of disability in the world uh, are a mental health issue or neuropsychiatric disorder. Those would be depression, alcohol use problems, schizophrenia, and bipolar. So four out of the six leading causes of disability, inability to work and function effectively, are psychiatric disorders. And then in addition to the significant uh, health and, and uh, social costs related to mental illness, individuals around the world, uh, even here in the United States, are uh, often stigmatized, discriminated against, and are the victims of human rights violations because they have a mental illness and because of the misunderstanding in relationship to that. The church has a significant role to play in recovery and healing from mental illness. One of the things that most people don't understand, but that we've known in psychology for many, many years, is that individuals experiencing psychological distress are much, likely, much more likely on average to go to a clergy member or ministry staff before they go to any other, mental, or any other professional group. That includes mental health professionals, physicians, anyone else. They're much more likely to go to a clergy. Now, why would that be? It's an access issue. It's very difficult to get in to see a psychiatrist or a mental health care provider on the spur of the moment, but it's very easy to get into a pastor or a ministry staff person. Uh, and so we know that these individuals are coming to the church first, uh, so we need to be prepared for them coming, and it's a wonderful opportunity that God's provided for us, both for evangelism, but also for the opportunity to help them heal and recovery. One of the things that's also important that we recognize is that individuals that come to the church in psychological distress often do not come understanding that they have a mental health or mental illness. Uh, mental health problem or mental illness. Uh, they often come from other they come for other related issues. For instance, maybe a relationship problem or a parenting issue or a marital problem or a financial troubles. These are symptoms of an underlying mental health problem, but they come to the pastor or the clergy for that. Uh, whether the pastor or clergy member are able to recognize that they have a mental health problem, that's a different story. Now, the Christian community, unfortunately, much like the general population, has not done a very good job in the way they treated those that would have mental health problems. Uh, generally, there is stigma in the population in, relation, in relationship to mental illness, but in the Christian community, there's a kind of an over-spiritualization of these problems. In fact, in research that we've done, we find that 30 to 40 percent of Christians who approach their church in relationship to a mental health problem were told that they do not have a mental disorder or that there is no such thing as a mental disorder. And in those instances, when people were told that, they were told that their mental health issues were the result of personal sin, a weak faith, or the demonic. Now, I'm certainly not denying that sin and weak faith and the demonic can't cause you to have problems, even problems that may look like mental health issues. What I'm saying, though, is to tell someone that they don't have a brain disorder when indeed those things do exist and have been demonstrated to exist is much like telling someone that they don't really have diabetes and they should just think that their pancreas works better and it will because it simply isn't true. While we certainly should pray for individuals who have mental health problems for healing, and God certainly can intervene in a, in a supernatural way and, and heal them, we would never say the same things that we say to the mentally ill, that we say to those with diabetes or cancer. While we certainly pray for them for healing, we encourage them to get treatment. 
One of the other things that we have to realize in the church is that mental illness does not just affect the individual that has mental illness, it affects everyone that the individual has a relationship with, particularly their family. In research that we've done, we find what's been found in the literature before, and that is a family dealing with uh, a mental, mentally ill loved one trying to care for them, it has a lot more stress in the family, more financial problems, more conflict in the family. The family dynamic is disrupted. But in our research, we went one step further, and we also looked at their ability to practice their faith and how their faith was developing or, or stagnating and how their intimacy with God was. And indeed, what we found is they have a, a significant inability to practice their faith. They don't pray as often. They don't attend worship as often. They feel uh, somewhat disconnected from the church. And when we looked at other church members and, and how they felt the importance of mental illness was in the church, they really seemed to kind of ignore or think the other individuals were invisible. They didn't really see that that was a significant health problem, even though one out of every four families in the church were struggling with that. So the issue here is we're not just talking about a single individual. We're talking about a family uh, and, a, and a large extended family and relationships that are affected by mental illness. And certainly the church has a significant role to play in helping individuals recovering, uh, recover from those problems. So let's talk about how God has created us. I think that's important as we understand what's been disrupted by mental illness, so we understand kind of the holistic view of a person. Uh, we all have a body. We certainly all recognize that we have a body. And as people of faith, we also recognize that we have a spirit, that some aspect of us is immaterial and some aspect of us is physical. Now, God made us both physical and non-physical. But in the church, we tend to focus almost solely on the spiritual, on the non-physical. We almost act as if the body is just something we put up with, and hopefully one day we'll just kind of float away into the clouds and we won't have that anymore. But the reality is, as the scriptures talk about a resurrection from the dead, that indeed God has made us physical and we will live with him in a physical way. That we are connected to him spiritually, but physically our bodies will be glorified and we will be physical, much like Jesus was physical. And so we have a physical body, we have an immaterial spirit, a non-physical spirit, but we also have a mind. And I think I like to think about the mind as a bridge between the physical and the non-physical. So the mind is an extension of the brain. You don't have a mind without your brain, but the mind is more than the brain. So it is also it's it's an extension of the physical, but also it is non-physical. So if we look at verses like, for instance, Proverbs 16:9, it tells us the mind of man plans his way. Another verse tells us that we pray with our mind. Another verse talks about we worship with our mind, with our spirit and with our mind. So I see this mind as a bridge between the physical and the spiritual, between the physical and the non-physical. And so when we look at an individual, we need to think about them as body, mind, and spirit. That's how God made us, and that's how we're affected by disorders and problems. So if an individual has a mental illness, it affects them body, mind, and spirit, just like if they were to have any other illness. If a person has diabetes, it affects them body, mind, and spirit. If they have cancer, it affects them body, mind, and spirit. So our interventions should be holistic and certainly the church has a role to play in those interventions. So if we think about a holistic approach to healing and recovery in relationship to mental illness, I would define it kind of in this way. I would say that what a holistic approach looks like is that physical and psychological suffering are uh, dealt with through medication, that would be the body, and through some type of psychotherapy and counseling, that would be the mind. And then in the in the combination, we're also revealing to the individual the unconditional love and limitless grace that's available through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the spirit. So we're interacting and intervening with the person at all levels of their being, their body, mind, and spirit. So in the body level, they might be taking medication. At the mind level, they might be having counseling, psychotherapy. But in the spiritual level, it's a focus on Christ. It's a focus on the, the redemptive aspects of the gospel. It's a focus on the transformation that can only come through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And as Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, as our mind is transformed, uh, ultimately we are transformed. And so as our mind focuses more on the spirit, as it depends more on the indwelling Christ, then indeed our bodies are transformed also. So if we look at a, a biblical example of that, I think it would be uh, in John 9, uh, we have the story of the man born blind. So Jesus is walking along with his disciples, and it says he saw the man first. And so I imagine that Jesus very quickly began to move towards the man. But when the disciples noticed the man, instead of rushing to him and wanting to minister to him or even wanting to introduce him to Jesus, the healer, the Messiah, they're more interested in wanting to know why he is the way he is. It's really kind of a self-righteous question. You know, they asked Jesus, did he sin or did his parents sin that he would be born blind? In the theology of the day, even the theology that we still find these days, 
uh, people with disabilities, people with uh, problems such as this poor blind man were thought to be punished by God because of some sinful thing they did. And those who didn't have problems, for instance the disciples, were thought to be more righteous because God was, was actually uh, honoring them by not punishing them in some sense because of good things that they've done. So the disciples are asking a very self-righteous question and that is why is he blind? What wrong thing did he do or his parents do? And of course look at me, I'm not blind. But Jesus answered them in a very, very interesting way, and he kind of blew their theology apart. He says it wasn't that this man or his parents sinned, but this man is blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. A very powerful statement to show that, indeed, God can take any situation, any disability, any illness that we have, and use it to display his glory in our lives and transform us through that experience. And so Jesus heals the man. He heals his uh, blindness, and he doesn't even reveal to the man who he is at this time. He simply relieves his suffering, both physical and psychological. And it isn't until later in the story, actually several uh, sections later in the story, where the man is humiliated and thrown out by the Pharisees, that Jesus finds him again and reveals to him who he is, and then revealing to him what a relationship with him can do for him spiritually. So the man sees both physically and he sees spiritually. But I think in that story we see a nice example of how we are to uh, act with anybody that's afflicted within the church. We are to relieve their physical and psychological suffering if possible, and we are to introduce them to the Messiah so that they might be transformed spiritually. And so I think that's really the example of a holistic approach to uh, healing and recovery. And I think it's the same example that we can use for those that have mental health issues in the church. So let's talk about what the church's role is. So how might you uh, as a person that might minister individually to somebody, uh, help them, or how might you help your church minister them better? And I like to call these the four R's. Okay, so the first R is that we embrace our role. So role is the first R. What is the role of the church? Well, as I just said, I think the role of the church is just what Jesus did with a man born blind, and that is to relieve physical and psychological suffering and to introduce those individuals to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and help them grow in their intimacy with Christ, regardless of what their disorder may be. So so I think we have to understand what our role is. If God is sending these individuals to the church first, which is exactly what we find, it isn't me that found that. Secular psychologists have known that for 50 years or more, that individuals in psychological distress go to the church first. So if they're already coming to us, then we should be prepared for them coming. We should be prepared to minister to them effectively. And so spiritual guidance and support should certainly be anchored in the church. That's where that's one of the roles that God has given us. Uh, in our role to the world is to introduce them to Christ and the transformation that's possible through them, through Him, and we should be prepared to give that to those that are coming already. So God is leading people to us. We should be prepared to receive them. So we need to recognize that we indeed have an important role. This is not just something that we give a referral number to and we have them call and go away. This is something that we should be intimately involved with. The second R is that we need to recognize the problem. So we need to be prepared and educated to recognize mental health issues. As I said before, when individuals come to the church, they often don't walk in the door and say, oh, by the way, I think I have bipolar disorder, can you help me? They walk in and they say, oh, I have a financial issue, or I have parenting problems, or I might have a marital issue. These would simply be symptoms of mental illness, because remember, mental illness affects a person's ability to think, their moods, their emotions, and their ability to relate to others. It's not to say that every person with a financial problem has a mental health problem, but certainly people don't automatically diagnose themselves when they have these issues when they come to the church. So we have to be prepared to recognize that sometimes there's something behind the issue that people come in with that may be mental health oriented. So we need to educate ourselves. Pastors need to educate their congregations and individual congregants need to educate themselves. We can do that through books, seminars, uh, online uh, situations, you know, online uh, material. And so there are a lot of opportunities to educate, but we need to be prepared to recognize mental health problems. An another way is to uh, to develop a uh, set of lay counselors at your church that have special training that might be able to pick up on those issues. This is a congregation issue. This is not just a pastor issue. So congregations should be involved. This isn't something we just hire a pastor to take care of. The fourth R is relationships. We need to build relationships with the mental health community. Uh, there's a mental health community and there's a faith community, and we need to connect them in some way because certainly there are things the mental health community has to offer for those that have mental health problems that the church simply cannot do, much like if we, a person had diabetes. If a person has diabetes, the church does not try to affix their pancreas. 
And so we don't need to try to fix their brain. We need to get them to an appropriate psychiatrist. We need to get them to an appropriate uh, counselor or psychotherapist so that they might get help in that way. But the church doesn't abdicate their role by simply sending people away and then hoping they get better. The church works in a team with these individuals. So spiritual guidance and support is anchored in the church. The individual is getting some type of mental uh, health help through psychologists, psychiatrists, and then, then their uh, body is affected by this medication. And so the church is working in a team. So a good thing to do is uh, to uh, interview individuals, go out to lunch with individuals. You know, see a psychiatrist that we feel comfortable referring to. Here are psychologists or a therapist we feel comfortable referring to. And so that you are ready to make those, uh, those relationships are built. And so one of the ways you can do is develop a mental health list. You go out, talk to individuals. You never want to send your people to somebody that you've never talked to before because in a sense you kind of get what you deserve if you do that. If they do something that you find inappropriate or didn't agree with, well, in a sense that's your fault because you never checked that out. Uh, you can start in your own church. There are probably plenty of individuals in your own church that are mental health care providers, psychiatric nurses, uh, counselors, psychotherapists, even psychiatrists. But you also might partner with an organization like my organization, the Mental Health Grace Alliance, or something like NAMI, that might help you make those relationships with the mental health community. That way, you're prepared when someone comes in. So we've recognized that we have an important role. We've educated ourselves so that we can recognize mental illness. We've built relationships with the mental health community. And now we need to be prepared to make an appropriate referral. Referral is our fourth R. So when in doubt, if a person comes in and you're not really sure whether you should make a referral or not, send them to a physician. Send them to their, their family physician for a physical. There are many physical illnesses that can mimic uh, psychiatric disorders. So for instance, uh, kind of a, a severe instance is uh, pancreatic cancer can mimic depression. It can look just like depression. And so send the individual to a physician for a physical. And then it might be up to the physician at that point to send them on to a counselor or something. But again, don't abdicate your role. Make sure that you stay connected with the individual because you may be their lifeline for spiritual guidance and certainly you're the lifeline for support if they see the church as their primary support. Um, after you make a referral, we want to make sure that we don't just kind of let them drift away into the wind. We want to follow up, make sure they went to the appointment. We want to follow up and, make, and see what they were told, see what kind of treatment they got so that we can help them move forward in that treatment. So we want to work as a team with the psychiatrist, with the family, with the therapist. This is a team effort to help this individual recover. And it's not something that's going to happen quickly. Mental health problems take time to recover from. So we should think in, instead of days and weeks, we should think in months and years. So this is not something you're going to take a pill and instantly the person's going to be better. We again need to think in months and years as far as recovery goes. And so we're going to walk along with this person as they get better, as the family recovers. And so we, this is really burden bearing. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says that we should carry one another's burdens. We're not going to carry it for two days. We're going to carry it for quite a long period of time. But that's what the church is about. It's walking alongside, living life and life with one another. And so we have our four R's. We understand we have an important role. We recognize the problem. We've educated ourselves. We build relationships with the mental health community so that we can get appropriate care for our congregants and our friends, and then we make appropriate referrals. We make sure they get to the people that can help them, and then we follow up with them to make sure that they're getting the help that they need and deserve. So these are the kind of things that we need to do in the church, and I think there, you know, this is not much different than we would do with anybody that was, uh, was ill. Mental illness has been called the no casserole illness because uh, when people get ill with other things, people make, it, at a minimum, people make them dinner, things like that. But with mental illness, we don't talk about it. So think about when the last time was you heard someone uh, prayed for in your church that has a mental illness. Or think about the last time you saw someone get up and give a testimony of the church's involvement in their recovery from mental illness. Or think about the last time that you asked someone that you're walking down the hall, how's your son who has bipolar disorder, and then they really actually told you how they were doing. Uh, the problem is there's a lot of st shame and stigma here, and there simply shouldn't be that in the church. We should be free to, uh, to share with one another the burdens that we're dealing with, and the church should play a significant role in that recovery and healing. So if you would like to know more about uh, how uh, you might help your uh, mentally ill loved ones or how you might help those in your congregation or how your church might do a better job ministering to those, you can go to the Mental Health Grace Alliance website, which is uh, Mental Health Grace Alliance all one word, dot org. And at that website, you're going to find a number of resources. You'll find a blog. 
Uh, you also find uh, an opportunity to sign up for newsletters. And we offer uh, support groups around the country, which we call grace groups, both for those living with mental illness and also for individuals who are caring for a mentally ill loved one. An individual who is recovering needs basically three things. They may need medication for their body. They're going to need uh, psychotherapy for their mind and, and then also the spiritual guidance to set. But they're also going to need support. They're going to need support around them. An individual that has no support around them uh, is much less likely to get well than someone who has support around them. And if a person comes to the church and the church tells them, well, by the way, you don't really have bipolar disorder and you shouldn't take that medication, we tear the support away from them that they're looking for. We're basically telling them, in a sense, as a representative of God, God doesn't have time for your mental illness and he can't really do anything about it. You're just a bad person. Well, the reality is, is that God does have a heart for those with, a mental, with that are mentally ill. God has a heart for anyone who's suffering. He has a heart for all of us. And the church has a significant role to play. So we need to be mindful of grace, and we need to approach individuals with mental illness uh, from a uh, position of grace uh, so that our recovering and healing that they have can be rooted in the church, and we can play a significant role in that. So thank you for your time today. And again, if you're looking for more information, please go to mentalhealthgracealliance.org.